Hello, my name is Graham Moyle. I'm a doctor at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London in the UK, and I'm going to discuss some issues about the remaining gaps. Here are my disclosures. Um, I'm going to firstly mention the things I'm not going to talk about, which are aspects of ending stigma and discrimination, establishing universal access to care, a pathway to cure, the development of preventative and therapeutic vaccines, broadly neutralizing antibodies and passive immunity, as well as gene therapies, inflammation, and of course, the ending of HIV and AIDS. So the things I'm going to discuss are the near future changes that we're likely to see to PrEP and to antiretroviral treatment. So if we think about the unmet needs in, in PrEP, awareness is a big issue, access, which is rapid, discreet, spontaneous, the acceptability of the PrEP to individuals, the efficacy, ease of adherence, safety and tolerability, and of course the consequences if somebody does become infected while receiving PrEP. So the potential ways to address some of those unmet needs include improving daily PrEP, reducing the frequency of oral PrEP, long-acting injectables, and the potential for implantables. So one refinement which uh, is approved in the United States is the availability of TAF-FTC as an alternative to TDF-FTC in PrEP based on the DISCOVER trial, the outline of which is described here. The outcome of that study was that there were numerically fewer uh, new, in, uh, new infections in the group receiving TAF-FTC relative to TDF-FTC, and there were uh, favorable advantages for the TAF arm in terms of renal tubular dysfunction and bone mineral density. The exchange to that being that TDF is associated with lower uh, HDL and LDL cholesterol, typically lowering LDL by about 8%. And TDF is typically associated with about a half to one kilogram of weight loss during the first year of therapy, whereas TAF uh, placebo in IPREX and cabotegravir, as I'll outline in a moment, are all associated with similar amounts of weight gain during the first year of therapy, typically one to one and a half kilograms. One of the challenges we have with TDF FTC is the emergence of resistance uh, were an individual to get infected while receiving or being partially adherent to uh, PrEP. And this paper from uh, the IAS this year underlines a number of individuals in sub-Saharan Africa who were presenting with uh, PrEP-associated mutations, so 118 infections of whom 23% had uh, known resistance mutations. And those included mutations to the components of PrEP, both to TDF and to FTC, and sometimes included additional mutations which are uh, prevalent in the uh, African population, particularly K103N from past efavirenz exposure. So uh, an alternative to this is long-acting injectable cabotegravir. That's been studied in two trials conducted by the HPTN network called 083 and 084. They all start uh, as placebo-controlled trials where there is an oral lead-in uh, followed by the commencement of cabotegravir injections after five weeks. The oral lead-in is for tolerability reasons, not for pharmacokinetic reasons. And then there is a lead-out at the end of the clinical trials, which is individuals need to take oral TDF-FTC for a year after stopping injectable because of the tail of that drug. The study was stopped by the uh, Data and Safety Monitoring Board due to the dramatic differences in the uh, protective effects of cabotegravir and TDF in 084 in cis women and in 083 in trans, uh, trans women and, uh, and MSM males. A lot of this is driven by the adherence in the TDF FTC arm uh, with only about uh, two thirds of subjects having detectable TDF throughout the study. Looking at the 083 study, there were four individuals who developed infection while reliably receiving CAB. Many of the other infections were uh, reported in that arm were either present at baseline occurred during the oral lead-in period when there may not have been optimal drug exposure or occurred after a prolonged period when the individual had not received cabotegravir. So that looks like a highly effective PrEP. Now, another approach to this is to use the 
novel nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor called Izlatravir. This has a number of sites of action. So uh, if, if resistance occurs at one of those sites, potentially it will still be active because of its, act, of its activity at other points of action. The drug has a very long half-life and monthly oral dosing of 60 milligrams of Izlatravir maintains exposure that are anticipated to be uh, protective in a PrEP setting based on uh, PK models. So that's now gone into clinical trials as one month oral PrEP. Again, there will need to be some uh, cover of the tail there. In terms of uh, other advances with Izlatravir, you may be familiar with the Nexplanon implant, which is used in female contraception. And Merck are looking at the idea of putting Izlatravir into an implant, which may be create, create a more prolonged uh, PrEP without the need for any oral dosing. And two of the doses there that they've looked at uh, look like they have the potential uh, to provide annual uh, implanted therapy. Uh, so that's uh, shown in that slide. Another drug that is of interest in PrEP is the new capsid inhibitor, Lenacapavir from uh, Gilead. This is a study in, uh, in prevention of vaginal transmission uh, of SHIV in macaques, showing that the two doses of, uh, of uh, lenacapavir were effective and the 300 milligram per, per kilogram uh, dose prevented all transmissions uh, following challenge. So uh, that's also advancing in PrEP. So it looks like in the PrEP area, we do have advances with regards to uh, improved daily, monthly oral, eight weekly injectable and the potential for implants. And I haven't spoken about the depivirine ring. Now, in terms of antiretroviral treatment, physicians have our needs around efficacy, safety, tolerability, genetic barrier to resistance, pharmacokinetic profile uh, and convenience of administration as part of our approach to achieving long-term suppression. Patients are very focused on safety, tolerability, and the intrusion that medication makes into their lives so that they want to have medication that facilitates them leading a normal life. So with rapid start, we have some unmet needs around drugs that we need to use regardless of knowledge of CD4 viral load, transmitted resistance, and hepatitis B. We also have the consideration of the diagnosis of TB leading to the diagnosis of HIV infection and drugs which can be given alongside effective anti-tuberculous therapy, depending on the susceptibility of the mycobacterium in the region. Safety, tolerability, and long-term efficacy, um, resistance, intrusiveness, and the uh, ability to take drugs alongside comorbidities and not have interactions with medications for co comorbidities. And of course, we also have an interest in the role that drugs may play in inflammation uh, and reservoirs. So, uh, the advances in ART that we're seeing, more and more companies are looking at two drug options rather than three drug options, which have the potential, although uh, not clear how, uh, how much potential has been fulfilled so far of having improved safety. And then we have the options around uh, long-acting medications. And then we have drugs for multi-drug resistant virus, which won't be extensively examined in uh, treatment naive patients such as ibilizumab and fostemsevir. Lena Kapavir, I'll uh, discuss in a moment, uh, and then potentially Pro140 and a maturation inhibitor. This meta analysis of two drug studies with dolutegravir 3 TC underlines that uh, the combination has uh, similar or better efficacy than three drug standards of care uh, in these patients that have been specifically selected to go into these studies, which of course include, exclude individuals who have uh, transmitted resistance to uh, either component or have hepatitis B uh, as examples. Then we have injectable treatment with, uh, with cabotegravir plus rilpivirine. Again, like we saw in the PrEP studies with a period of oral lead-in. And the initial studies such as FLARE included uh, just four weekly uh, injectable dosing. A reasonable mixture of people going into those clinical trials and then into the extension trial and with uh, rates of virological suppression that were comparable to oral therapy within those uh, studies. There's also been a further study of eight weekly injections 
which was the ATLAS study, which showed similar success to four-week dosing, although numerically there were more confirmed virological failures in the eight-week dosing relative to four weeks, and there were some uh, relevant mutations to both rilpivirine and cabotegravir appearing in both arms. We do know that the injectables give a little bit of forgiveness with the majority of subjects still having detectable and therapeutic exposure of drugs uh, if there is a small delay to treatment. But what injectables do is that they require process. They may require changes to the way in which a person uh, attends their clinic and into the facilities available at the clinic. Uh, and this uh, presentation um, uh, at IAS this year talked very much about the process of getting there and the types of infrastructure and attitude changes that were needed to establish uh, injectable treatment and to ensure that people adhered to attending their uh, injectables. I've mentioned Islatravir in the PrEP session, um, and it is also being studied both as uh, daily dosing, in this case with Duravarine in a two-drug regimen, which has proceeded to phase three after this phase two uh, B study, which compared against Duravarine 3TC TDF and showed similar efficacy uh, across a number of different uh, doses there, and that they have an extensive clinical trials program for that regimen. There is then a second long-acting non-nucleoside MK8507, which is being looked at as weekly dosing alongside Islatravir as a two-drug regimen that is proceeding in clinical development. Uh, and this drug appears to have few drug interactions and uh, favorable pharmacokinetic uh, profile um, with exposures in the therapeutic range uh, over uh, a week. And then there is a maturation inhibitor that has reported some clinical data from GSK. Uh, this works similar, similarly to berivimat uh, a few years ago, but adjusting for the issues that berivimat had with regards to target. They've undergone a, uh, a dose finding study with the drug, which showed uh, reasonable efficacy over uh, seven days of dosing with the drug. But unfortunately, they did have an individual who uh, rebounded uh, with resistance uh, after seven days of dosing, suggesting that the drug has a relatively shallow barrier to resistance. The pharmacokinetics, however, are very supportive of once or possibly less frequent dosing. And then we have lenacapavir as the first capsid inhibitor. It's undergone uh, the Capella study in treatment experience subjects uh, alongside optimized background treatment. And we see uh, marked reductions in uh, viral load with the majority of subjects experiencing at least a half log reduction and high rates of suppression given the, uh, the difficulty of treating these subjects. It's also undergone a study alongside oral treatment, so an injection uh, and, and together with oral uh, TDF FTC, uh, the injection is once every six months after two days of oral lead in for pharmacokinetic reasons. Uh, and uh, they showed similar efficacy to a triple uh, drug regimen uh, using this approach of lenacapravir plus the two drug oral uh, of TDF FTC. There was one subject who did develop lenacapravir resistance at the anticipated sites of emergence who presumably wasn't taking their oral tablets at the same time. So this is a drug that might be useful in a range of different circumstances, but does uh, look like it has a relatively low genetic barrier to resistance. And both Merck and Gilead have talked about a collaboration between Islatravir and lenacapavir development to look at implantable devices, as well as long-acting injectables with a target of a subcutaneous six-monthly injection, the implant potentially being annually or less frequent. So we've got a range of drugs that are, uh, that are uh, creating advances in art that are going to improve daily therapy, uh, potentially reduce the frequency of oral administration and move us into an era, an era of injectable and implantable therapy. That will still leave us with a number of unmet needs, uh, probably the most important ones being access to care, and the cost of therapy, uh, and potentially the pathways in the future to, uh, to cure strategies. I'd like to thank colleagues at Vive Gilead Sciences, MSD, 
and my colleague Anna Milinkovic at Chelsea and Westminster for their assistance. Thank you.